Hello and welcome to the Battle of the Kentish Knock. Battle of Kentish Knock. Long Patrol. <laughs> I keep wanting to say the Kentish Knock. And um, I can understand why. It's an interesting it's an interesting battle. And Kentish Knock is actually a how to put it. Not so much a sandbank, but as a sort of almost promontory in the North Sea. It takes place 469 years ago today. Sort of. On the Gregorian calendar, which is what we tend to use these days, it's the 8th of October, 1652. On the Julian calendar, it's the 28th of September, 1652. So, please note, there are a lot, and I, I say this with joy and hope in my heart, there are a lot of interesting data analysis going on in this video, and will go on in the live, which this will come out before. Mm -hmm. So, for those who don't know, my family communicates its love by bets, by family, familial bragging rights bets. And my aunt has sent me one of these again. Previously, she said I never get to 1,000 subscribers. Thanks to you all, I have more than that. She now said I won't get to 13,000 subscribers by December 31st. But if I do, she and my uncle will take photos wearing Blackburn, Blackburn face masks that you can find on this uh, history store, along with t-shirts and all sorts of far more... Um, useful things, because, well, we hope there comes a time when we don't have to wear face masks all the time. But t-shirts we should be able to wear for years, unless fashion really just really changes, in which case I'll be devastated. But then there's a mug or a mouse pad, so, you know, we should all need mugs. I need your help. If I'm going to get to 13,000 subscribers, I need you to, if you like the videos, to like them, to share them, to subscribe if you haven't, and basically to just please keep spreading stuff about naval history and keep putting it out there because that's the only way I have a chance of making this. And there are links to Discord, Spreadshirt, and Patreon, and all those things down below. Right, so, the First Anglo-Dutch War. This is the background to the Battle of Kentish Knock. And it takes place May 1652 to April 1654. Which, uh, for those of you who are keen students of history, will go, Hang on, wasn't that the time the British weren't a monarchy? That we were actually some form of republic where we had a king who wasn't a king because we he was called the protector the lord protector and he was called oliver cromwell and then when he dies they try to replace him with his son but he isn't as good so they'd end up hunting someone who's as strong and capable as cromwell was to run the country and they decide that of the century candidates the one best suitable is charles ii because he's as different from his father as possible and then, unfortunately, comes along after him James II, who is as close to his father as possible, who's then got rid of and replaced with, well, William, William, who is the actual William of Orange and his wife, Queen Mary, uh, who are the rulers of the Netherlands at this point, the Dutch, which is also a republic at this point. So it's two republics fighting each other. <sighs> There goes that idea that democracies don't go to war. Well, they're not really democracies, let's be honest. Anyway, so... There are various points you can start this on. It's a long-running saga. The reasons behind the Anglo-Dutch War. It's basically trade disputes and... All sorts of reasons are looked at to cover it. But I think it ultimately comes down to this. You have a Dutch Netherlands, which is ruled by a class of people 
who are used to being able to negotiate whatever they want and being able to get things through fine merchant practices and espousing a mercantile philosophy and a free trade philosophy where it suits them. But they do cloak themselves, especially their lower, their middle class and low class, in Calvinist Protestant ideology and Protestant thinking. But you have above that, you have a, well, that has, in contrast to that, you then have the British system, which is a class which is used to getting what they want by war. Let's be honest. The legacy of the War of the Four Kingdoms, the English Civil War, whatever you want to call it, the fact it takes place in Ireland, Scotland, and Wales, as well as England, and on the high seas in various places, suggests that the English Civil War seems a little bit absurd. And the fact that there are significant groups from all uh, fighting for all the different sides, and there are more than two, there's also a finely, a finely balanced neutral formation, uh, makes it kind of complicated. But the fact is, you then have a class and a rulership in Britain, as it would become, which is pretty used to fighting and getting what they want by war. They are not scared of fighting. They are not scared of fighting apparently insurmountable odds. It doesn't phase them. They lose, they come back. They lose, they come back. It's going to be interesting, is especially when you start looking at the differences in the way the countries are organized. Of course, the Dutch Republic and, well, United Provinces is often called, is made up of eight areas. Now, the stats general, they're the basically their version of a, I'm not quite sure we're calling it a parliament, but it's definitely, it, it's a representative body. Is actually only has representatives from the Duchy of Gilders, County of Holland, County of Zealand, Lordship of Utrecht, Lordship of Oswald, and Lordship of Frieza and Lordship of Groningen. The reason is the eighth one, the County of Durenth, is so poor it doesn't have to pay taxes. But as a result, doesn't get any representation. So um, that whole thing, no taxation without representation, kind of spins on its head because it becomes a double-edged sword. They have no representation, so uh, they are, let's be honest, the reason Denf, Denf is so poor is it's often used as a sacrificial land, a land and their land wars. So it gets ravaged by everyone. And this is the point at which it gets things really interesting, because that means you have eight states, seven, uh, uh, eight state provinces, eight states, which uh, combine into uh, only seven of them get representation. But there are only five Admiralties, and they don't exactly line up. You have the Admiralty of Rotterdam, which is the original one. And it's formed by various merchants who, frankly, are putting together to protect their merchant ships. Okay, The Admiralties are not formed by a central government going, we want a navy. They are formed by merchants getting together and going we want warships to protect our trade from spanish or spanish ships or french pirates especially the dunkirkers so you have amity rotterdam or amity of the Mar of the mars originally all of holland but eventually just the south then you have the amity of zealand who there probably is a reason why they're set up, but honestly, mostly the, the reason I can find is they're set up because they could. Because they weren't covered by Rotterdam, and frankly, they felt like having their own one. And there is a lot of money involved. Uh, then there's the Admiralty of Amsterdam, which is originally set up to cover the whole of North Holland, and is set up by the Earl of Leicester, originally. Can you saw? They also cover, at one point, part of Friesland. However, they don't cover the western Friesland, because that's covered by the Abruzzi of Noderwater. 
otherwise known as the Admiralty of West Friesland, and set up by resolution by Parliament and Mauritius of Orange. And then finally, you have the Admiralty of Friesland itself, uh, because the Admiralty of Amsterdam is charging too much for convoying and getting too much profit. Life happens. The Commonwealth is, if anything, even more confusing, or slightly less confusing, in that basically everything comes down to him, Oliver Cromwell. So, as if he is in, ch if he agrees with something, he has the army behind him. He has the power base. He's popular in the country. He's capable of pushing things through. People trust him. They respect him. They know he. Let's put it this way: there are many things which are alleged, uh, which are leveled against Oliver Cromwell, being corrupt and not giving him, not giving the very best efforts he can do, however bad they might have been, are not two of them. He throws himself into everything. He really pushes himself. In 1652, there is still the Rump Parliament. That's part of the problems of negotiating with. Netherlands, and they're the ones who actually propose this idea of a more strict and intimate alliance and union with the Republic. That was to me created by what was described as a confederation of the two Commonwealths. Pretty much the idea comes in its of issuing, to, uh, basically, of forming one country. That surprisingly doesn't go down well. And so eventually, the Dutch send the Grand Pentry. Pen, uh, Pen um, their highest official, Adrian Paul, to try and rebuild relations. It doesn't work, and I should point out the war starts because Cromwell... How do I put this? Well, the States General decide to expand their fleet by hiring equipping 150 merchant ships to escort their convoys. Then Cromwell issues an ordinance that... Well, reissues an ordinance that requires all foreign fleets in North Sea or Channel to dip their flag to in salute. And Lieutenant Admiral Tr Martin Trump's fleet didn't render this quickly enough, maybe because the sailors didn't feel like it, or disgruntled, or whatever. And so General at Sea Rob Blake's fleet opened fire, and that's the Battle of Dover. So I said, it all comes down to this gentleman. And in 1653, during the war, the, the Rump Parliament is dismissed, and the Bare Bones Parliament is called. And during 1603 as well, alongside us, they also, uh, uh, the English Council of States uh, dissolved and replaced by a new council, chosen by Cromwell, because frankly, the Council of State is annoying him. And in April 1654, the Tender of Union is introduced uh, to unite England and Scotland under one government. And in September 1654, the first Protectorate Parliament was called, and that turned into a great runny fun thing, a fun thing. But hey-ho, that's after the war is over. So, let's consider the Battle of Kentish Knock. For starters, this is Martin Harvesten Trump, who has been dismissed as the Dutch commander, much to the annoyance of the Dutch Navy because, frankly, they thought he was a very good animal. But he wasn't aggressive enough. He wasn't going for a kill. We are the Dutch. We are the masters of the sea. We should uh, destroy the English. They are mere impotents. We will destroy them. We will do... You can imagine all the stuff going on. And so they replace him with a far more aggressive wit, Cornelian de Wif. Who is... Hard and brutal. No, he's not. He's characterized as brutal in several histories, but he's really not. He is a very hard sailor. But how do I put this? If I was comparing him to British history, I would go Raleigh, Drake. He adopts a grandfatherly, elder statesman approach to running what is an extent always a alliance fleet 
I because you have ships from the different admiralties, you have other vessels which are hard on the various reasons. It's a complicated process of managing it. He is more used to operations where it's uh, it's one fleet from one admiralty, and you can you are the admiral, you are the divine right. So Trump can balance those competing interests and his competing views far more successfully. But that means he has to operate a conservative style leadership because whilst Amsterdam and Rotterdam might want a more aggressive style of leadership and more aggressive results, that doesn't mean they necessarily can get them and that the other navies are willing to risk their few ships because they don't all have enough ships they can risk them. This is the point. Right. Now, Trump is relieved after the Battle of the Shetland Islands. Which I can't find a date for. Okay? I have a possible idea. But, according to the lovely Dutch, it takes place in August 1652. But according to the English, on their calendar, the only action which is remotely possibly similar takes place in July 1652. It's this one. There is the potential it's there's the Battle of Plymouth, but no. And the fact is this is the Julian calendar. And the Dutch might be going according to the Gregorian calendar. They could be. And that could explain some of the date confusion, but... No, the Battle of the Shetlands. And before anyone starts thinking, there is a reason this book is right behind me. I have been going through this book non-stop to try and track down this battle. And the closest action I can find to a Battle of Shetlands is that on the 12th of July. So, this might not be a good look for a naval historian with a PhD and a YouTube channel to admit, but at the moment, I'm out Fox on this one. I think it's the 12th of July one, which is... And the reason I think of that is because they talk about Blake's action. And the one where Blake is leading is where his frigates and grit frigates attack the Dutch Fishing Guard Squadron. They take 12 Dutch vessels. And that's in the North Sea. So that can sort of be around Shetland. And they take a lot of fishing boats. And they do a great, a, a lot of things. And, you know, we're talking, that would fit with it. That fits with the description. It might be the news takes longer to get back to them. I, I'm not sure. Especially after losing all their ships, that might mean it takes longer to get back to them. Now, I have to say, there is one person who the movement of his body almost caused Charles II problems. And that is General C. Robert Blakes. He was incredibly popular with sailors. He's born in, 10 years after the Armada. And he's born in 1598. And he dies. In 1657 at Sea of Plymouth. He holds the Mediterranean fleet. Is always one of his commands he's held. But he holds many, many squadrons. And other commands in his time. He serves 1649 to 1657. So. In eight years. 
he fights in the English Civil War, he fights in the First Anglo-Dutch War, he fights in the Barbary Pirate Campaign, the Anglo-Spanish War, he does all sorts of battles and successes. He earns sufficient laurels that Nelson will always compare himself and find himself wanting in comparison to Blake. There is actually was an interesting argument put forward in one book. When I was reading it about Blake, was that if Blake had still been alive when Cromwell had died, he might have presided, provided precedent for the senior admiral taking over the state. <laughs> because he was more popular than Monk. Or as he becomes the Duke of Almar. But, <clears throat> now, if you thought it was just a problem with the, uh, the senior commanders and them being put in, well, let's say there was more complexity than that. There is the fact that in typical Dutch fashion, there are multiple commanders. There is John Everson, who is dismissed by De Witt. Oh, De Witt. He, he, he gets rid of it. He says he doesn't like, you know, doesn't, he doesn't consider him a good admiral. Uh, there is Michael Andreessen de Ruiter, who with tries to get rid of, but decides that might be pushing too far. And there is Johann's older brother, Cornelius Everson, the elder, who is actually a commodore. Johann was an admiral. The younger brother was an admiral. The elder brother is a commodore. The Battle of Kentish Knock is... A true example of the Dutch issues when it comes to command and when it comes to, I'm going to put this politely, when it comes to the fact that they are pretty much allied operations. Because the whole way through this battle, there are going to be issues between the Wyth and his senior officers. The whole way through. In fact, at one point, the Wyth is going to try to transfer his flag to Trump's former flagship and the crew's going to refuse to let him on board calling him green cheese and threatening to fire a salvo on his boat if he did not stop waving around his commission papers from the Stats General what's also worse is that after he had become um, leader uh, of the uh, Navy Lots of not just sailors. It's always it's just sailors that deserted. Actually, no, senior officers desert as well. Decide they'd have or they have far more pressing issues to do, and this actually means that he ends up having to hoist his flag aboard the Prince Wilhelm, which is a VOC ship, i.e., the Dutch East India Company. Think about that. None of the ships which are actual warships of the Admiralty want you aboard. So you have to go aboard one of the slower hired merchant ships to exercise your command. And in contrast, Trump in contrast to uh, uh, Trump, never had that trouble. But in contrast to the issues of poor De Wyth, who I really I feel sorry for him, anyways. Blake decides I'm going to be fighting a Dutch. Mm -hmm. I like being on Sovereign. She's powerful. She's the largest ship in the fleet. 
but that makes her less maneuverable, and I want to break the Dutch line. Okay, so he moves to the former HMS Prince Royal, now called the Resolution, and transfers his flag. And it's done quickly, and everyone greets him very happily. <laughs> it's, it's, it's good when you are successful and lucky, and people like you. It makes changing your command a lot quicker. It was not going to be a good battle for any. And the Whiff had, of course, um, insisted on a decisive battle, despite even the Reuter, who's not known for exactly being bashful and coming forward, um, suggesting that there were better circumstances to do, and the Whiff had insisted, I shall lustily lead the fleet to the enemy, the devil may bring it back again. That's not really going to make your people happy. And that's a picture of the resolution, as it was called then, but former HMS Prince Royal. And this is the British fleet. This is the information we have about what they were. We don't really know who their commanders were. We know who so uh, we know that Sovereign was the flagship, but then transferred to Resolution. We know which are hired merchant ships. And I had an interesting time because I have to admit, honestly, two of those names come from sources I obtained by hunting through the Wikipedia archive. Uh, 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 Wikipedia. Um page and going and following the links because there there were lots of the books had and unnamed small ships and wikipedia had the names and i went where did you find the those names so i hunted through their uh, their records and i found a very obscure little book <laughs> and managed to get a digital copy of it so thank you whoever I'm not sure who you are whoever put in the references on the ba uh, battle of kentish knock page on wikipedia thank you <laughs> you did a really good job <laughs> I couldn't find those that, that those the references otherwise. Um, so it was really useful. This is the British fleet. You'll notice they are sovereign resolution, eighty guns, a hundred guns. These are the big ships, the second and the first rate. However. 66 guns, 60 guns, 50 guns. These would be later on termed probably fourth rates. And they are making up the vast majority of the fleet. And then it's fifth rates. Overwhelming majority of the fleet. This is a frigate battle. They might look big ships. They might be dressed up to look like big ships. See this stern? It's gorgeous. So this is the 88. This is the equivalent of a second rate. This is the first of two pages on the Dutch, because again, the glory of being the Dutch, they are far more bureaucratically organized, perhaps because they have five admiralties. You'll notice that these ships are all from the Admiralty of Amsterdam, Friesland, and the Mers, i.e. Rotterdam. There are more, there is another page of these. And you also notice the sheer number of other admirals involved. And that's because of the fact, uh, this is because of the way the Admiralties are organised, they all like to have their own rear admiral there to represent their interests. These are their ships. Look, Amsterdam. They can call the shops because they're providing a vast number of the ships involved. The Dutch have 68 ships. Of those, 17 come from the Admiralty of Amsterdam. 
but there is a small problem. It's riven by politics. Yes, the Admiralty of Amsterdam provides 17, of sh uh, 17 of ships. Yes. They have tried their best to organize as large and as powerful fleet as they can. But then you have Zealand's, the Amsterdam Chamber of the, uh, the VAC provides some ships. And then the Middleburg Chamber of the VAC provides another couple of ships. Where both uh, <clears throat> Commodore de Reuter and Vice Admiral de Witt are on their ships, which are some of the larger ships. I, some of the larger ships available are also the ones with merchant sh uh, merchant builds, so they're not built to be fast or maneuverable. And as said. Trump's ship refused. Refused the whiff. So, Trump ship, of course, being the Brederod, the 54 gun Amrati of the Mars, or Rothdam. And if you look very carefully, the only 54 gun here, and if we go down this list, it's the only 54 gun vessel which is built as a warship. It's by and far the most powerful vessel which the Dutch have at this battle, and it has just refused, point blank, to have the Admiral aboard it. There are none of these ships were captured or anything, so that's why they lost that little bit on the side. Uh, but I, I do also draw you to this one. Um, now, it's got a Z there, and I thought, well, perhaps this means Amalty of Zealand. And I did check into that and look into that one. And I think, actually, no, it's owned by someone who obviously might have had difficulty writing because there are various ships which you can see are owned by various directors and even a couple of ships which are owned by personal personally by people merchants are available in the dutch navy at the time and they're hired and i wonder if this person is literally someone who can just write a z for their name. That's how they sign their name. Either that or the lists of the Admiralty of Zealand are wrong. I will though, while I'm here, correct one thing. There is one other thing though. You'll notice I haven't included any ships from the Admiralty of the Nordkin Water. And this is another thing which is going to quickly pop back to Wikipedia because there is a list, a ship listed as the Wappen van Ixensen, which is listed as being part of the Admiralty of the Northern Quarter, which is the Admiralty of the Northern Water. So it's. I can understand why, because they have done the English translation of the name. That's why there is a difference. If you do go to Wikipedia to check those sources I said earlier, this is why you'll see there is a difference in my list because I've standardized them all down to the Admiralty they were part of. And uh, the Wappen von Erksen, not blown up. It does well. The Burr von Alma or Wappen von Alma is blown up. That's under the commander or, or command of a guy called Geri Nobel. 
And this is a picture of the Admiralty of the Northern Water there, Admiralty building. It's rather an interesting structure when you consider the Dutch had quite so many Admiralties. They each seem to have had their own rather impressive building. So, pre-battle. Well, when they encountered each other on the 28th of September, and I'm going by some of the accounts here, but it's also, remember, it's the 8th of October as well. The Dutch had 62 ships and about 1,900 cannon and 7,000 men. The van of Dutch fleet was to be commanded by Michael de Rutia, because that way de Wyf was fairly sure that he were, uh, that um, de Rutia would not skip battle, which was something he seemed to be obsessed with people uh, being cowards. The centre was commanded by de Wyf himself, and... The rear was commanded by temporary rear admiral Guinea de Wyf of the Admiralty of Amsterdam, which was kind of interesting because there was, as you might have noticed, a actual proper rear admiral of Amsterdam, as in Jan Giddeson Verberg of the Admiralty of Amsterdam there. Amsterdam. But at no point does de Wyf seem to have considered him for a commander. So this is how riven with command issues this fleet is. Dutch fleet were approaching from the east, had the previous evening been again scattered by a gale, and was still dispersed when it saw Blake coming up. Going, woohoo! They're all dispersed. Concentrate! Uh, so get Blake was coming up and had a nice south southwesterly breeze behind him, which gave him the weather gauge. And so basically Blake is going charge <laughs> Dutch there <laughs> disorganized <laughs> I don't get opportunities like this every day of the week <laughs> I'm going for it and then the battle takes place um action is finally joined at about five o'clock in the afternoon As the fleet approaches, that's Blake's fleet approaches, the Dutch ships began to give way. They they seemed to be almost pulling back. Uh, fortunately, unfortunately for the English, at the same time, the wind slackened considerably. So both fleets slowly pass each other on the opposite tack. Normally, being in a leeward position would give you actually longer range, so it would have been advantageous. But the gentle winds meant that the larger English ships with slightly more uniform guns and a lot of people who were very experienced professional artillerymen, sailors, soldiers in their ranks um were able to uh cause a lot of damage and they did both the sovereign and the james managed to run aground on kentish knox sandbank itself um Re resolution and dolphin managed to venture too far forward in blake's eagerness to um attack the Dutch. Eventually they were saved from surroundment by um, other English vessels basically going, <gasps> well, how'd I put it? If it had been the Dutch and had been De Witt in trouble, I don't think anyone would have been going after him. But Blake in trouble, the English captains and crews had no trouble motivating themselves to go, we are not letting our Admiral be caught by you. The Prince William, which, of course, the whiff was on, was disabled. And the whiff was then hampered in his efforts leading his forces. It wasn't really great to begin with. It didn't really have much control.
by seven o'clock the fighting stops with the onset of darkness um and the maria has been captured the gorkum which was captured but was abandoned by the english as it was in a sinking condition was reoccupied and saved by the dutch and as I said the Burr von atma blew up at which point several dutch ships decide to uh leave their formation and disappear next day um 10 dutch ships captains from zealand who really disliked the whiff um broke off the engagement and simply sailed home this is probably because during the uh morning meeting the whiff had helpfully called all zealand ca Zem captains cowards and warned them that Ho in holland there was a still sufficient wood left to erect gallows for any of them that's a well-known good method of leadership there um the Dutch now had 49 ships, whilst um, the English fleet were reinforced to uh, from a 62 to 84, because at home for the English, even if they had been inclined to lead Blake, which they weren't, uh, there was Cromwell waiting, who really would have <clears throat> had interesting conversations with them. And so DeWiff now withdraws. Uh, well, first of all, he tries to sail south in the hope of gaining weather gauge. And it turns more into a sort of running fight with the English coming after them. And eventually, De Wyff and the Reuter cover the retreat with a dozen ships, and the Dutch don't lose any more vessels as they get the hat. Unfortunately, this battle has consequences, and the consequences for the British English are that they get cocky and send a fleet to the Mediterranean, which means they are severely outnumbered when it, com uh, they when it comes to the Battle of Dungeness, so they lose the Battle of Dungeness. And even worse, the fleet doesn't get to Mediterranean in time, so they lose the Battle of Leghorn because they don't have enough ships out there either. So they've sacrificed their advantage in north uh, in northern waters because they thought they'd secure the, the devastating win on the Dutch. They only sank two ships. That's not a devastating win. But I presume they thought that the, the Dutch wouldn't get re uh, replaced with the Tromp so quickly, but they did. And the Dutch then win these two battles, and the Dutch think, yes, we're back on a winning streak, we're going to win, and then the Battle of Schoen happens. And they lose. And it's really, really not a good battle for the Dutch. It's not a good ba battle for the, in, uh, the British either. It's Monk in charge, rather than Blake. There are 120 warships on his side, there are 127 on Tromps. And whilst it's a strategic duct victory because they break the blockade, the English sink more Dutch ships. They lose between, well, some claim it's also claim as many as 30, some as little as 14. A lot more killed. And that leads to the actual agreement of a peace treaty. But. More will be covered in the live, link to which down below. And I hope you enjoyed this sort of introductory long patrol to the Battle of Kentish Knot. And what we've got to come up, we've got ship design on the 10th of October. And the patron, uh, patron votes, uh, patron, the results of the patron votes will be announced also on the 10th of October. So look forward to it. Enjoy. Thank you.